Um, I do want to uh, introduce our uh, facilitator uh, for this session, uh, Andre Jordan, who is with the Illinois Department of Human Services. He is the Director of Legislative Affairs, and he's going to facilitate this policy panel. Uh, so take it away, Andre. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I will be leading the panel. And then, of course, we will also have uh, Director Ronnie Patrick from the Illinois Division of Rehabilitation Services, as well as Jordan Jensen. She's a career coach, uh, and she works very closely with students with intellectual disabilities at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And then hopefully uh, we will be able to have Leader Greg Harris of the Illinois General Assembly. Uh, the General Assembly is actually in the middle of veto session, and he will do all that he can uh, to break away as he has some very pertinent legislation on the House floor today uh, and try and join us through the middle of this panel or right towards the end. So with that being said, uh, we'll go ahead and get things started. Um, but yes, it's great to be with you today, here today. So um, I can go ahead and kick things off if that's okay. Uh, yeah, with the great. question that we have. Sure, sure. So uh, the first question of the day that we have here um, is what are current or upcoming policies that impact this population? We could uh, chime in and let's have that discussion with the first question and I'll repeat that. What are current or upcoming policies that impact this population? Anyone want to take a stab at it first? So, um, Jordan, I'm trying to be deferential. Um, I'm going to dive in, though, so but feel Perfect. free to. Okay, great. Sounds so, good to me. Um, great. So I'm Renee Patrick, and I'm the director over vocational rehabilitation here in the state of Illinois, <clears throat> which is, um, you know, we're, we're really in charge of our mission is to um, undo the um, inju un injustice that disabled people face when it comes to unemployment. Disabled people have a at least double unemployment rate for people um, that are uh, of those without disabilities. And so with that mission um, as the director, some policies that you know impact folks with disabilities in general, you know, would be the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Rehabilitation Act, um, of, of 1973 that's been re-upped and amended uh, um, all the way up to 94. Then we were included into the Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act in 2014. Um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act is another one. And then and because this summit is focusing in on folks that are gender nonconforming, transgender, um, and um, also folks living with HIV, there's also the Ryan White Care Act um, and then the housing opportunity for people, um, for persons um, with AIDS. Um, some of those kind of policies are in place that impact um, these populations from um, my perspective. Um, we also just had an executive order, as I mentioned in the morning, um, signed by uh, Governor Pritzker, which um, said that people with disabilities um, that uh, wouldn't be paid subminimum wage when it comes to state use contracts. So that's my my initial thoughts on that, Jordan. That was, what do you that think? was great. Um, I think you covered a lot of it. And I guess just going off of what you talked about, um, I'll revert back to, you first mentioned the Americans with Disabilities Act and specifically Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which is unemployment. And it's designed to help people with disabilities access the same employment opportunities and benefits that are available to people without disabilities. But I think it's important to note that even though this is true, disabled workers still remain um, severely underrepresented in the workforce. Um, and just I'm going to get a few statistics kind of just from um, 2020 is People with disabilities um, ages 16 and older and for the labor um, force participation rate is only 20.5%, which is very low compared to people without disabilities um, where the number is 67.1%. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's important to be aware of those statistics and the fact that 
yes, these policies exist, but more work definitely needs to be done. Okay. That sounds good. Thank you um, for that input. Uh, I know we have uh, a little time that was taken off uh, here today due to the audio issues, but any other thoughts come to mind um, out there in the audience that um, might need a clarification or would like to have someone uh, as far as Director Patrick or Jordan expand upon a little bit? Okay. Okay, I think, um, thank you so much for that information uh, and addressing that question. Uh, we also have another question, a great question here. What are the emerging issues that need to be addressed in the near future? And I'll repeat that. Uh, what are the emerging issues that need to be addressed in the near future? I know there's a lot on the table and concepts, thoughts, concerns, or creative ideas but uh, what are the emerging issues that uh, come to mind that we need to address um, almost immediately? One of you want to take that question for us, uh, Director Patrick or Jordan, please? Well, Jordan, if you're okay, um, I'm gonna, you wanna go? Okay, okay, great. So I, um, one thing, so I was part of this uh, earlier this year of a first ever, national convention around employment um, and um, living people living with HIV. Um, and what that uncovered is that there are a lot of policies um, that really need to be addressed. So when like future, like long term for sure, um, when you talk when we think about the question in terms of it being in the near future, you know, there's there's federal guidance that were policies that were to adhere to in terms of a state. I'm run a state agency, right? And so I really want to comply um, with those expectations that are set um, by the federal government, you know, and essentially um, the United States Congress. Um, but what happens then in terms of meeting the needs of people in the local state level, um, even deeper in the communities, neighborhoods and things like that, the flexibility, which was addressed earlier this morning, um, doesn't doesn't isn't allowed as well because of these like greater um federal uh guidance and so some of the things that i learned from that convention in terms of you know things that we could do um is like barrier removal um and so that we could change some of these um laws like you know ryan white care act the wioa is mentioned affordable care act uh, rehab act like how are we um going to make it so that it does meet folks more on the local level. So, you know, if we could get together, um, create those flexibilities that could make opportunities to um, make sure that we're not like really getting in the way of ourselves, like being our own barrier to accomplishing our mission, um, allowing for us to address the holism of a person. So if a person needs to get to this employment goal, if they need some supports, um, in their in their care in their health care um, when it comes to HIV uh, care um, maybe them some of the traumas that they, that folks have experienced um, you know hope I hopefully Jordan will talk about folks that have intellectual disabilities that also have HIV or a transgender you know like all also there is also service delivery that and policies that need to come together to make a difference. Um, we the, we also the group also um, earlier this year identified needing to um, have uh, further funding like more funding around um, employment like and allowing for employment to be a priority um, in those uh, funding streams and just generally for people with disabilities there's just so many um, uh, disincentives that allow us. Um, and I'm a disabled person, and I came through vocational rehabilitation. And, um, you know, what I learned very, very early on um, when I was applying for the services is that I would not, for me to get, get the assistance that I needed as a disabled person, that I had to maintain a level of poverty 
and, and also hold back like any sort of earnings, uh, retirement benefits, anything that allowed for me to be financially secure in, in my future um, was, was not allowed, it prevented my eligibility for the programs. And so these disincentives um, that are created um, really prevent the goal of employment for disabled people. Yeah, I, I think you brought up some really great points. Um, and kind of going back, you talked about barriers. Um, and I think there definitely are um, significant barriers that disabled people face when it comes to accessing employment, applying to jobs, starting from the very beginning. Um, knowing what jobs are even out there, it's hard to access those. Um, and I also am someone with multiple disabilities, um, specifically invisible disabilities. Um, so also kind of tying into the pandemic since that's relevant, um, Americans with disabilities were disproportionately affected um, by the pandemic and also by pandemic related layoffs. Um, also, I guess in contrast to that, and you talked about um, flexibility, the ability to work from home for some people allowed for significantly greater flexibility. And then in contrast to that, um, that might have also created even more barriers and cons just because of needing to work more hours and different expectations, a shift in expectations, um, causing a lot of disabled people to feel very overworked. Um, so I guess kind of backtracking a little bit more, um, workers with disabilities um, for years have experienced access barriers and logistical challenges. Um, and this is obviously due to a multitude of reasons that do need to be addressed and some that have been, um, but there just is a significant lack of flexibility in the workplace. And for one, um, kind of tying into my role um, as the career coach um, at UIC. So the barriers to higher education um, and or just career field training and um, different career fields, there are so many barriers. Um, and just higher education in general was built on naming whiteness and men as the um, primary um, gender. And um, I think that that is something that needs to be addressed and just what higher education was built upon. Um, so kind of just talking about my role, um, like I said, I'm the career coach at UIC in the Department of Disability and Human Development for um, the certificate and cooperative career um, experience. So that is a new um, program for individuals with intellectual disabilities and autism. And we're actually launching the program for this upcoming spring. Um, but I think it is important for there to be more programs like this that are fully integrated, where people with disabilities are taking courses with their peers um, without disabilities and learning career skills, training for careers of interest that they actually want to engage in and pursue. Um, and also just acknowledging those barriers. I think it's easy to pinpoint what they are, but it's another thing to actually um, acknowledge the barriers and make change. Um, yeah, and I think that can be specifically for um, employer sites and organizations and businesses. I think um, they can individually address those barriers and make change. But from a policy standpoint, I think that it's important for um, federal laws to acknowledge that and hold people accountable. Right, and I was also thinking too, Jordan, about like um, the, that there are also sectors in, in workforce, you know, that are emerging or developing that we, that I think could recruit talent from folks with disabilities, you know, to, 
be able to make their organization stronger. Um, I think we've seen the need for, you know, virtual platform, like you talked about, like there's shortcomings, there's gains and negativities around, you know, working remotely, but that we've also exposed, um, um, you know, the need for software and, and you know, those kind of uh, utilities, you know, Wi-Fi and things like that are needed. And so who is the workforce to, to do that, um, I, you know, given that to say we're unemployed, you know, so much more high and at a higher rate, could we get more folks to fill in those, um, you know, those that workforce, you know, need and, um, you know, I know that there's autonomy works here in, in Chicago, you know, that works that really has created a niche for uh, folks with uh, specific disabilities, autistic folks, um, they were featured on 60 Minutes, and they really had, you know, connected up some of those, the strengths um, related to specific disabilities, and then going into the, you know, information technology sector. So, also want to say that in terms of employers and, um, you know, the 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 work, the employ, yeah, the employers and and just um, and the industry to, you know, needing to recruit and bring in disabled people, and also just doing a social justice, you know joining the cause for social justice for people with disabilities around employment. For sure. And I think um, just one thing I want to say based on what you're talking about is employment's a right. Um, and I think it's important to keep that in mind and not view it as something that people should have access to, but that it's a right um, that all people should have access to. And yeah. I just really want to stress that. I think that's important. Well, that sounds great. Um, thank you for that information. Um, I know the leader couldn't join us today, leader Greg Harris. Um, but if we were to have him available and uh, send a message or encourage others to reach out to the members of the General Assembly to address the barriers that we foresee going into uh, 2022, uh, what would be uh, one of the asks that we will put forth and, and definitely uh, bring to their attention. I know we talked about how the pandemic has affected everyone uh, through funding and then Kawoya. Uh, maybe we could explain that as well, uh, that process and what it, uh, what it entails. What was that, um, sorry, director, um, what was that last part? Uh, if you could elaborate about the uh, WIOA w -I -O -A process a little bit more. Mm -hmm. That would be great. I know you mentioned that earlier for those that uh, might be unfamiliar. Yeah. So WIOA is, um, it creates a, it, you know, it integrates the, all the workforce bodies. So, um, you know, we have the higher education, we've got trades, um, the, um, in, you know, this, um, employment security, and then vocational rehabilitation gets combined uh, into you know, like we've come together and we're to be together. And actually that's how the summit actually started was us wanting and, and wishing to be integrated. Um, and so folks, <clears throat> people with disabilities can come in and, and engage with all these different sort of uh, state agencies and, um, and get the services and employment services and uh, educational services that they need. What, um, and so that's the, the that's what, it's a, you know, it's a one-stop sort of a, approach where, you know, it's an, um, what they also say like no wrong door often, meaning mm -hmm. that people can come in and, and, and engage with um, workforce to get that goal of, like you talked about, Jordan, that right of being employed. Um, if the leader was here, and um, I know I um, have a lot of respect for um, Representative Harris, I... I understand that um, for transgender um, folks, and, and so this is focused on transgender folks with disabilities, that the transition into um, you know, a, a name change because of a transition, um, a gender um, uh, transition um, has been a barrier um, and it causes, it, it, it's inherently traumatic uh, because uh, it, it, it relies on 
um, the born born identities of people. And and so you know the the trans actually the governor had met um, with uh, folks that represent the transgender community here in Illinois and asked the workforce agencies like my own agency vocational rehabilitation that we address um, these barriers that are faced. So if there's anything that we can do to be compliant with these federal um, expectations and and then also allow for people to come as they are and be who they are, um, it would be, I think, really helpful. I also find as an administrator that having a binary, um, you know, like there, of genders, like either a male or a female when people are coming in um, for their initial assessment. And so that expectation of, of a binary gender um, is also, I think, um, uh, we'd like to change that in vocational rehabilitation and right now we're working on making those adjustments in our data collection, um, but it's not an expectation and so um, it may be that sometimes things change based on, you know, expectations. Great, great. Thank you for that. I don't, um, I, I don't, mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, no, thank you for adding uh, that information um, to help uh, for others who might have uh, been curious. So yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and if I cut you off, you can please go ahead and finish that last thought there, if you don't mind. No, you did not, Director, thank you. Fantastic. All right, okay, uh, we'll go ahead and um, there is uh, perhaps one more question. What advice do you have for people who want to get involved and advocate for this population? I'll repeat that again. What advice do you have for people who want to get involved and advocate for this population? Um, yeah, so how can the attendees get involved? I can start. Um, I guess for one, <laughs> um, hire disabled and chronically ill people, but don't just hire them. Um, pay them a competitive wage. Um, I see in the chat box, um, sub-minimum wage is a big barrier to competitive and integrated employment. Um, I agree. Um, I definitely think that some minimum wage is something that should not be ex in existence because it definitely um, is a significant barrier to many. Um, I also think it's important to remember that workplace diversity is not just a social responsibility or an obligation, um, but it's actually an asset that makes a business stronger. And disabled workers bring so many um, strengths to individual businesses and um, the workforce in general, because for one, um, we're innovative. <laughs> Um, they can bring creative thinking, unique perspectives, um, and just significantly influence um, a business to be um, competitive, um, deal with unforeseen um, circumstances such as the pandemic, um, and help them be more productive. Yeah. Um... Totally um, agree. And, you know, as the vocational rehabilitation director, um, we're, we are charged to get folks with disabilities competitive integrated employment. While some minimum wage exists in the state, then it, it does, it's counterproductive <clears throat> for the mission of vocational rehabilitation um, mission, like what we're trying to do. And so um, that is an important, I think that the governor take, took a bold and important step to, in assuring and following through on his commitment to equity that, that the um, you know, state use contracts aren't allowed to use sub minimum wage. Um, and so that policy change is, is extremely helpful for division of rehabilitation services to accomplish its goals for uh, com competitive integrated employment. I, um, what I wanna say in terms of what people should do to get involved and advocate for this population, it would be super helpful. Like I learned 
I got in fire about this when I went to this convention about employment and people living with HIV. And I did not realize how untapped my passion was about it. And I'm somebody with a disability who is, who's, whose purpose in life is to do make a difference for people with disabilities. And so if you can understand your own self about what you don't know, like get to know what you don't know um, about people with disabilities, gender nonconforming people with disabilities, transgender people with disabilities, people living with HIV, HIV is a disability, like understanding um, that you can really do something um, about, about it. And so like working on the internal bias, get involved, um, and and um, and you know look at with what is within your control to make a difference. I think is um, some ways that I would recommend. Yeah, just one thousand percent. I completely agree with that. Um, and also like putting in place um, structures to mitigate those biases. Um, I think in individual businesses and organizations, that's really important and something that um, people can do um, is train employees um, and have them receive training to build awareness of their um, biases and be able to acknowledge them and make change. And like you said, acknowledge what they don't know um, because that's super important. Um, I also think I'm just reading this question in the chat box that says, um, what does a panel recommend to stress to employers um, that it is in their interest to hire or accommodate individuals with disabilities? Um, I think we kind of mentioned this, I think a little bit earlier, but um, as for accommodations, I think it's important to acknowledge um, accessibility beforehand and not just put give individuals accommodations when they ask for them. Obviously, give people accommodations when they ask for them, but have your workplace be an accessible environment, um, not just once people are asking for accommodations, but actually make it accessible from the start. Um, that might be ensuring that an application is accessible, designing an interview um, or the interview process with accessibility in mind, um, and also just having clear processes and protocols for responding to accommodation requests. Um, train employees or current employees um, who are maybe hiring managers. Um, and like I said before, like pay disabled people a competitive salary and give them a competitive offer. That sounds good. That sounds really good. Thanks for the information. Um, okay. All right. Uh, so yeah, so thank you. And um, let's see if we have anything else in the chat there um, that we can address. Uh, that we haven't. And then Director Patrick, uh, I know you identify as having a disability. How would you recommend or what suggestions would you give for an employer who, who might uh, uh, need to be notified? You know, with so oh, many I've... of the subtle parts. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Director, I got so excited. Please complete your thoughts. <laughs> no, no. I would just say, how would you recommend disclosing your disability to an employer? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that. I mean, I come from being a hiring manager myself and also being a disabled um, person. And, you know, and I, so I hired people with disabilities. I've also been on the interview side and, you know, select um, recruitment selection process. And I was always told at the beginning that just say it in the interview. And what is um, often 
so hard about that is that you are, um, it is a lot of stigma around being disabled. There's such an old, very, very old trope that having a disability means that you're unproductive. And um, we hold on to that still very deeply as human beings. So, um, you know, it's a lot of that internal um, unconscious bias work that we have to do as, as people who have these rights, these protections that won't be able to protect us, like through the America's Disabilities Act, et cetera, until we, we identify as having um, a disability or fulfill that eligibility to be protected by those. Um, employers, I think, you know, there's, you, there's ways, my understanding is that there's way, you, you know, you need to be careful about it because you don't want to come across as biased, right, in your uh, recruitment and talent selection process. Um, and, and yet you can still um, show that you're welcoming. You can let somebody know, like maybe having um, a symbol up or I have a painting back there by a famous, you know, disabled artist, you know, there's ways that, you know, your, your space, your interview process could indicate that, you know, it is, um, uh, um, it's okay to divulge. Um, but people are nervous. Um, um, when I spoke at a organization um, few many years back, the uh, to a group of disabled affinity group of disabled feet peep workers the the folks expressed that they were reluctant to divulge because they didn't know what that company was going to do with that data about them being disabled and so there's this distrust that's happening between employers and and and, and employees so um there, so because of that context, you know, the, the recommendations that I outlined earlier um, are some of my um, experiences and ideas. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Jordan, I didn't know if you had any thoughts that you might want to add, uh, fill in any blanks maybe. Um, I guess the only other thing like to add is, um, I agree from a personal experience, I find it easier in the long run to disclose um, in my experience, my own disabilities um, at the beginning. But I do wanna note that disability disclosure is a choice and that an employer legally cannot ask someone um, what their disability is, um, even if they do disclose the fact that they are disabled. Um, I think that's something important to know. I didn't, Thank you. I didn't, mm -hmm. I did note oh. director Jordan. I did note that there's, um, some, um, chat feedback too, um, that talks about folks that have backgrounds. So some of the, in the space, um, earlier this year, I did learn from folks that are transgender, um, with disabilities and all, and, or living with HIV that you know having a having a criminal background also becomes a barrier and so you know we can as employers allow for those not to be you know requirements like if someone doesn't have a background allow for that not to be um a requirement um like you you don't have a background and then you you can still be employed at your organization um and I mean, it probably sounds pretty like aligned with what I work on because we're re rehabilitation and so belief in how people can change and that we can't, we shouldn't phrase people in time, um, uh, you know, so, um, you know, considering the impact of backgrounds. And I also noted too that some requirements for um, policies of some, you know, some workforce development programs um, around birth certificate, you know, um, needs and things like that, like if there could be adjustments to that so that we can make our, our programs more uh, successful in terms of being welcoming and help those folks get some jobs. No, that's great. Thank you. That is wonderful uh, information and thank you for sharing it with all of us, uh, especially from a personal aspect. Um, all right, well, I'm trying to see if we have any other uh, questions or any other 
information that we'd like to share. Again, we apologize for um, Leader Harris and on his behalf, he apologizes uh, for not being able to attend uh, this afternoon. Um, obviously, he would love to have been on the panel today to share his thoughts and answer the questions and about policy and uh, how to get involved uh, from his perspective as a legislator and what they need to hear and as well as uh, being active in this community. So with that being said, uh, Director Albert and Jordan, uh, we really appreciate you uh, stepping forward and being leaders uh, today for the summit and in your retrospect uh, positions of authority and uh, being amongst us and sharing your thoughts and ideas. So uh, if you have anything else that you would like to say in closing, uh, I would start with you, Jordan, and then I would leave it up to you, uh, Director Patrick. Yeah, I don't think there's really um, a whole lot more that I have in closing, but um, I definitely think it's important to keep encouraging this dialogue, not just during um, the month of October, but year round, um, and encouraging disabled people and people who are um, with HIV um, or transgender non-conforming to have um, the opportunity to engage in dialogue and um, be a part of policy change and lawmaking. I, this is Renee. I totally agree with you, Jordan. And I, um, I mean, I just have, I have a lot of work to do as the director of rehabilitation services. Um, to achieve what I want, which is a, um, a disability neutral welcoming um, workforce agency um, geared to employ people with disabilities in competitive integrated employment. And I wanna take us there and be the best in the nation. Thanks. Well, thank you both for your time and I will kick it back over and we will uh, proceed uh, with an update here. So thank you. Well, thank you, Leader Harris. We really appreciate you joining. Uh, this is Andre Jordan, uh, Director of Legislative Affairs for DHS. And uh, we were just thanking you for uh, the work that you're doing uh, in the General Assembly and in your community, in your district. And some of the questions that we covered today, uh, I know uh, we're about to round out the session, but we asked, and uh, maybe if you could chime in on possible uh, one of the three, what are current or upcoming policies? Um, well. How about this one uh, due to time constraints? What advice do you have for people who want to get involved and advocate for this population? Um, yeah, I, I think the important thing is to make your voices heard to whoever your own local state senator or representative is. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think a lot of folks don't come forward with these issues. So my colleagues will say to me, well, gosh, we haven't really heard from anybody in our town or our county or our district who this applies to. So it's just, it just becomes lower down on their priority list. And we know, we know we're everywhere. So making your voice heard, whether it's a phone call, whether it's an email, a handwritten note, these things are very important. And the more personal it is, uh, the more important it's given when we receive it, as opposed to say like a petition or you know an auto-generated email. So, you know, a personal note talking about how this has changed your life or could affect you or a, a loved one or family member goes a long way. Great, thank you for that information. Uh, we really appreciate that. And also it's just good to know that, um, as you mentioned that um, constituents need to be heard from. So don't assume that, um, that it's not worth the effort, as you mentioned, letters, phone calls, outreach, because personal stories matter and uh, they connect uh, a name or a face uh, to a personal issue. And that goes a lot further when uh, when advocacy is concerned, as many of you know here on the call. So um, we also talked about potential emerging issues that need to be addressed in the near future. Uh, what would you like to see, Leader Harris, if I could ask you uh, that we address uh, or, or is it possible to address in the next session or the next general assemb assembly uh, that might be coming up here soon? Well, yeah, I think one of the lessons we've learned from COVID is something that we can apply to all kinds of different situations. And that is 
for you know a, a lot of the population will get their messages through media or social media or mainstream media uh, but a lot of other folks are going to need a lot more personalized more culturally competent and you know more individual outreach you know we've seen this with the fact that there are 200,000 people who are eligible for health care under Medicaid in the state of Illinois, but have not enrolled. And just like you're trying to get people, you know, vaccine education and testing education, you know, some of those folks may have you know, different language issues that we have to deal with. There may be you know, different accessibility issues we have to deal with uh, with them. Uh, absence of computer or internet connection, all those kind of things. If we really want to reach folks who are really struggling, we're going to have to meet them on their terms and their homes and on their locales. And I think that that's a lesson I, I'd like to see applied to all kinds of things. Great. Thank you so much. And again, uh, I know you're being pulled in different directions, especially during veto sessions. So yes, we really appreciate you taking the time to step away and uh, jump on the call here and offer your uh, wisdom and insight. Uh, so I think that's it, uh, Leader Harris. Um, if you have any closing remarks that you would like to share or provide, that would be fine. And, and then we'll wrap things up. And uh, uh, I, I just want to thank so, everyone for the work you're doing to help you know people who have had their own struggles before the pandemic. Now, you know, people have even bigger struggles during the pandemic and you know, every you know, hand that's reached out has made a difference and helped people in their lives. And, you know, we're just very grateful for the work that folks do every day. Fantastic. And thank you for being a champion. <laughs>